خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين وشفيع المذنبين الرسول المؤيد والنبي الممجد المصطفى الأمجد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما على الإمام المنتظر وحجة الله الثاني عشر ابن العسكري المنتظر ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فإن الله الصادق العليم قال في كتابه الكريم القرآن الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حتى إذا جاء أحدهم الموت قال رب ارجعوني لعلي أعمل صالحا فيما تركت كلا إنها كلمة هو قائلها ومن ورائهم برزخ إلى يوم يبعثون سلوات Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Into our sixth night of our discussion, and we are rapidly approaching the end of the first phase of the two phases of our discussion. And inshallah, from tomorrow onwards, shall witness all of us the commencement of the next phase. In the series, which will then focus on aspects and events that lead up to the Day of Judgment. But before I can embark upon it, Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Without beating around the bush, time of constraint today, tonight, and we can expect to go on a little further than what we normally do in consideration of the fact that tomorrow is Sunday. And tonight's lecture is going to be very important, as will be the lectures on the night of Ashur and the last majlis, because those will be of paramount importance with respect to our solutions that we need to find in addition to tonight's because as we had discussed last night that tonight we will focus on those solutions for all the things that we have heard for the past five nights so tonight would be the solution for the problems that we have been discussing in the previous five nights of the phase one of our discussion of this series of this ni these nights of Muharram. And last night we started on the fact that what are those sins, what are those acts, what are those deeds which if done will definitely entitle us and make us eligible for being the recipient of the punishment of the grave. And at that time and last night we spoke about the behavior with the wives and the ladies. And apparently the ladies are very happy. However, all good things do come to an end. So those things will also come to an end. I had initially intended that thing to end tonight. But because the ladies do so much for the mothers, I want to give them one more respite for a weekend. So the males will have to hear one for one more night. They treat me fairly and squarely. Before Monday night, maybe settle the scores and set things right. Because both sides of the coin, right? If there's a fishar of qabr for the males, then there should be something for the ladies. 
But let's let them enjoy for some time. We had discussed one of the things that entitle a person to, to, to become the recipient of the punishment of the grave is the fact that he, the male, does not behave well with his wife. And the details have passed. And we saw the importance, however high the rank of a person may be, however high the, the status of a person may be. But if he has a certain event attached to all his good deeds, that event will have to be, the score of that event will have to be settled without which there is no way. And despite Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh with the rank, the status, the elevation, and the martabat that he had in the eyes of the Holy Prophet, in the eyes of the angels, yet we find the Holy Prophet admonishing the mother that don't think that Sa'ad will have a free passage to paradise. Because, كَانَ عَمَلُهُ مَعَ زَوْجَتِهِ سُوَا his interaction, his behavior with his wife was not good. As a result of it, he's facing the squeezing of the grave. Having understood that, let's move to the second point. What will entitle us to become the recipient of the punishment of the grave? And there, before I could reach at this point as I am today and tonight, I had started off with a brief discussion on what is haqqul nas and haqqul la. And what are the mean, what is the meaning of rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rights of humans? And yesterday we discussed and last night we discussed that when the time comes for forgiveness by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the authority that he has placed upon himself by himself is that as far as any misdemeanors that may have been committed, any intransigence that may have been committed, any obstinances that may have been committed by man with respect to me, by the sake of martyrdom and shahadat, I'm willing to forego, I will let it go. What I will not intervene is the haqqun nas. That means somebody has usurped somebody else's property and money. And now this person comes to me and says, Ya Rabbi Ghfirli, forgive me. I will not forgive him because not that I cannot forgive him. Not that because Allah cannot forgive this person, but forgiveness by Allah of this person who has usurped somebody else's right will run in contradiction to the adalat and the justice of God. Because on the day of judgment, that person can come and tell God, how did you forgive him? He had not, he had committed a sin of yours, yes, when you say that do not usurp the property. But the property that went was mine. Without the property having been returned to me, how could you forgive him? So because of the adalat and the justice of God, God refrains from intervening in such situations and says, you want to seek forgiveness for me, from me for the sin of yours. First return the haqq of that man. After you have returned the haqq of man, come to me and seek forgiveness and I will forgive you. And this haqq nas is so detrimental, is so important. And it is so encompassing that you can expect forgiveness from those sins that are there of God. But this and getting ahead and passing this bottleneck is very difficult. Such an extent that even if a person is very good, and even a pers if a person is very virtuous, and even if a person is very pious, and even if he has good deeds, but if this aspect of haqqun nas is there, despite him being in comfort, he will have to face the problems of the haqqun nas. Listen to this incident. Incident narrated by Marhum Mullah Naraqi, a very big scholar. He's narrating, and again you should realize, and you ought to realize, and we ought to understand, that these things that we see do not every time take place. These are one-off instances whereby Allah casts aside the curtains of ghaib to show at certain times the people about realities that the imams and the prophets have said, so that people do not think that these things that have been said by the masum are only stories. And that is the reason that even the twelfth Imam, Hujjat ibn al-Hasan, Ajjalallahu Farajahu Sharif, upon going into his ghaibat e kubra it is said that nobody would be able to meet the Imam. But there have been so many instances of scholars and ordinary people like you and me, having been given the privilege of meeting and witnessing the sight of the holy Imam. 
Not that it was intended and it had to be done. But at times Allah makes these things visible to the people so that the people understand that those things that have been mentioned that I have got a twelfth hujjat who will be in this world and who will continue to live in this world till this world is filled with equity and justice is not a, is, is not a part of fable is not story, is a reality and then because of this reason several people have met Imam and they attest to the fact that this reality exists and it is true. Similarly for this case, Mullah Naraqi says, one day I went to Wadi as salam and you will usually find such instances taking place more often in Najaf and then at a later stage in Qum because those were centers of spiritual perfections, scholars were there. And they were the most likely persons on, from whose eyes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would cast the curtains of ghayb aside. So Mullah Naraq, he says, one day I go to, I go to Wadi salam in Najaf, that graveyard in Najaf, for doing the ziyarat of, of, the, of, the, of the dead. Saying, I go there, I recite ziyarat, as I'm about to leave, all of a sudden, I experience that I'm witnessing something that I'm not usually witnessing. Saying, what happens? He saying, I look down and I see suddenly the grave that was near me, there's a, a, a depression. A step leading downstairs. Somehow something forced me to go down. He saying, I took my step downwards and all of a sudden I found myself in a different realm. Because now I'm looking all around, it is not that same dilapidated and, and, and those simple... Uh, structure like the, like the graves. It's a different world. I'm seeing gardens all around. I'm seeing beautiful sceneries all around. As I turn to in, in front, I see there's a big castle. And from my outside, I can see somebody is inside the castle. When I, I take the effort to, to go towards the castle, as I'm at the doorstep, I find that at the far end of the hall, or whatever you call it, the, the corridor or, or, or the room, I find a person sitting with, with, with a very radiant look, very, very beautiful look, fakhr clothes, glorious clothes, uh, radiant face, luminous um, demeanor. And he's sitting over there at the top. Around him there are few people and it seems that they're discussing and they're talking to each other. While they are talking in front of them there is a lot of delicacies and, and they're happily discussing, talking, eating and in a very happy state in, in something that, that I, have not, I had not witnessed in this world. But as I'm watching the scenario stunned, flabbergasted, what is this, which place is this? I've been coming to Najaf Ashraf, Wadi Salam so many times to Ziyarat. This place has never met my eyes. I've never seen this place. Where is this? How did this suddenly come about? I'm just thinking that w what place could this be? Who could these people be? When all of a sudden, I'm seeing that while they are in a good state of partying, a snake comes in from beside me and passes by. And slithering, it goes towards that entire group. Now it was very visible, it was very apparent. This entire group that was sitting had a leader. That leader who was sitting at the top of the table. And everybody was turning to him, talking to him. He was talking to them, issuing guidance, instructions, suggestions, whatever. And this snake subsequently moves forward, slithers towards that person who's sitting and appears to be the head and appears to be the master of all this, this, this building and the place. He goes there and he bites him on the big toe. As soon as that snake bites him on the big toe, Mullah Naraq is saying, I'm witnessing him. He suddenly begins to writhe in pain. His, the color of his face changes. It pales and you could see that this man is in intense anguish. He's in intense pain. He's controlling himself. And after a few minutes, you could see that the pain subsiding, the pain subsiding, the pain alleviating, the pain goes. The snake, after biting, is gone. Now after this incident, the person comes back to normal. Again, the discussion starts. And he says, I, Mullah Naraq, he says, I thought now I should ask him, what is this? He's saying, I was taking some few steps forward. But I was hesitant how close to go when it, because of my hesitation, quite, a, some, quite some time passed. When all of a sudden, before I could speak up again, again I saw the snake coming in. Again the snake slithers forward, goes to that person who appears to be somebody of rank because of the status that can be seen. But again the snake goes and bites that person on the big toe. 
again the biting takes place, again the color drains from his face, again the writhing, again the anguish, again the pain, again the control for a few minutes and then again the pain subsides, the snake goes away. Now this becomes too much for Mullah Naraki to bear. So he goes and says, Ya you al Akh, oh my brother, where, who are you? What place is this? I don't understand what is going on. So he says, the man replies to him and says, Mullah Naraki, come in. So he says, you know me? He saying, yes, I know you. But don't you know me? So Mullah says, no, I don't know you. He saying, yes, you must be knowing me. He saying, what? He saying, I'm one of those neighbors of yours that was living over there. In the lane next to yours. He saying, but that person was, was uncouth basically. He had a very... A rough appearance, you so beautiful, so 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 radiant, so luminous. He's saying, I was a very good man, and I was doing my wajibat properly. I was refraining from muharramat properly. I would try to be a good person. As a result of which, Allah has encamp- encompassed me with His mercy and His rahmat and His kindness and favored me with His grace and bounties. And this is where I stand. He's saying, what is this place? He's saying, this is a castle that has been given to me, a palace, it all belongs to me. He's saying, the garden, he's saying, all belongs to me. Who are these people? He said, these are my subordinates and we are having discussion, we are enjoying. What place is this? He's saying, this is the barzakh, this is the paradise of barzakh. Fine, very good, mabruk, mabruk, good, congratulations that, that you've reached the stage, but problem. Our question, Mullah asks. He's saying, what are you questioning me about? He's saying, understandable, you were a good man, you've been rewarded, this, that, paradise of barzakh. But what is the position of the snake that comes and starts biting you? He's saying, ah, this is one thing that I cannot do away with. He's saying, but this is paradise, in paradise there is no problems. What is this problem that is coming? He's saying, Mullah Naraqi, the snake comes repeatedly after an intermittent interval, a specific interval, and its job is to enter, come, sting me and go away. And this happens several times in a day. And the very sight of that snake coming to me is a horror. So despite being in pleasure and pain and ex- pleasure and prosperity and ecstasy and joy over her, that sight of that snake takes away everything till that time it stings me puts in his poison, that is enough to kill me. But this is barzakh, there is no death over here. So I have to tolerate it. Till after a certain time, automatically the pain subsides and I return to normal. I dreaded that moment when I see the snake. Despite being in this comfort, that is one dread that I cannot do away with. So Mullah asks, but what is this? He saying, this is the punishment of one mistake that I did. The whole of my life I would mold myself to work according to the rulings of God. The whole of my life I would mold so that I would never go in contravention of God. Except on one instance a lapse was committed by me, as a result of which I have to face this. And this will continue up to the day of judgment, unless somebody intervenes on my behalf. You saying, what was that mistake? Remember, Hakkun Nas we are talking about. You saying, what was the mistake? You saying, mistake was that I have always been wanting to be a good man. But to be good is one thing. To be good properly is another thing. To try to talk about religion is good. But try to talk about the religion as religion demands is another thing. Remember two lectures previously we had said, to talk about jihad is good. But which jihad? The jihad that is being run all over the world. That jihad? No, that is not the jihad. So the correct thing to be said is what matters. He's saying, I wanted to be a good person. As one day after Salat of Dhuhr, I was coming out of the mosque, and I was passing by a shop, when I found the owner of the shop and his customer, there was an argument. The argument focused around this point, that the shopkeeper was telling the customer, you owe me 300 dirhams. And the customer was saying, no, you're making a mistake. I owe you only 250 and because of this 50 dirhams, there was a, there was a, a, a conflict between them, a kind of a quarrel, a dispute between them. That person saying, you owe me 300, this person saying, you owe me 250. I trying to be good, which now I realize is dodai opano. You know dodai? Smart, smart aleck as you call it. Saying, because of that I intervened. Saying, why are you fighting Bana? What is the problem? 
Shopkeeper says, I, he owes me 300. Customer says, no, no, I owe him 250. So I intervene and say, Baba, don't fight. Let's do one thing. You, shopkeeper, come down by, two, by 25. The difference is 50, right? You come down by 25. You rise up by 25. 275, yeah, Allah, finish it off. The shopkeeper is saying, I owe, he owes me 300. I told him, Baba, let go 25. Because of my insistence and because of my dominant manner of approaching, the shopkeeper remained silent. This customer, because of the silence of the shopkeeper, felt he had agreed. So he takes out the 275, gives it and walks away. I think I've done a good deed and I go away. Whereas I did not realize the shopkeeper really th wanted from him 300. It was a mistake of the customer that he thought it was 250. I had messed up 25 dirhams for that person. The moment I come into the grave, I, I, I'm told, you are a good man, you performed all your wajib, all the muharramat, you will be given the barzak of paradise, the paradise of barzak, but because of that 25 dirhams of this man that you acted as a smart aleck and caused this person to lose 25 dirhams, despite your good acts, you will be given the palace, you will be given the castle, you will be given the rank, position and honor in paradise, but because of that 25 dirhams, up to the day of judgment, the snake will start coming and keep biting you every hour. Hakunasa, We become so good. Oh, rather we become so lax. We have taken money from somebody. Somebody helped us at the time of need. Now we don't have that need. We have the money to repay. We don't want to repay. Aapso. Kya re aapso? Malakul mot avi jai. Pachi naya pisho ko haan. Pachi naya pisho ko. Then whatever Hajj, whatever Amal, whatever Ya Hussain, yes, you will get the reward. You saw this reward, sitting, aram, comfort. But the snake will come. Hakunas never mess around. And we don't think and let us not imagine and fall into this fallacy that Hakunas means a million dollars is the only thing that will be taken into account. Only if it's a big amount of ten thousand dollars that it takes into account. Not even a hundred dollars, not even a dollar. Listen to this and then we move forward. Hakunas, very important. Very important. At times we, will, we may not understand why so much emphasis on such a small thing, as you will hear now. But this is how it is. This incident has been narrated by Ayatollah Dastaghay bin Shirazi in his book, Ma'ad. The story is about a person, a very pious person in olden times in Iran by the name of Suleiman Darai. Ayatollah Dastaghay writes this in his book. There's English translation available, go and check it out, the youths can. Suleiman Darai was a person who was a very pious man. It so happened that he happens to pass away. A very pious man. After one year, after one year, one of his friends happened to see him in his dreams. He saying, Suleiman, Salaam Alaikum, one year you passed away, after one year we are seeing, so happy am I to see you. How are you? Such a pious man, I see you are in a good state of affairs. Beautiful face, beautiful, you look in comfort my friend, how are things? He's saying, my friend, it is only yesterday that I got out of trouble. It is only yesterday that my awab was terminated. So this friend is saying, Suleiman, you are telling me after one year you became free from the adab. You, one of the most pious persons of the community. You, one of the most obedient servants of God. We've never seen you falling into haram. We've never seen you leaving out the, the, the wajibat. You say after one year you are now relieved yesterday. What happened? He's saying, I wish I had not done that. Said, what did you do? What, did you commit zina or something? He's saying, Maadala, that is too far. What I did in my eyes could have been so trivial. But in the eyes of God, it was so immense that for one year I was in pain and punishment because of something that when I tell you, you will think that's such a trivial thing. Saying, what happened? He's saying, one day after having my food, I left my house. As I left my house, I was wanting to go to some place. But I found that in my teeth, particles of food had got stuck. I was trying to take them out by my tongue, it was not coming out and it was inconveniencing in me. Discomfort I was in. 
So what I did was, I observed that this beside me, there was a person who was taking his camel, carrying, carrying chaff, carrying, you know, those splints of wood when you, when you, when you saw some wood and you have those sawdust, you have small, small splinters. It is, it was, it was tied in a bale, put on a camel and the camel was going. Because I was getting inconvenience, I picked up one small little piece, one tenth of a toothpick from that person's bale. I put it into the mouth, took out that particle, threw it and went away. Moment I went inside, I was so Suleiman, a very nice man with a very bad deed. All your good deeds on one side, how did you take that without that person's permission? One year you will face for that small little splinter which you would not even want to look at. Forget about pay money for it. This hakunas for a small little toothpick, small little splinter, it may not carry a value, but the ideology remains, don't take things that do not belong to you. It may be a million dollars, it may not even be worth a quarter of a cent. But whatever it is, if it is not yours, don't take it. This is the rule of God. Don't fool around with it, even if it is small, because the smallest of things caught like Suleiman Darai. One year for the thing that you and me would regard it as absolutely trivial and insignificant. This is the importance of Hakkunnas. Now we want to know what is the problem, what is the solution from, from, from the, from the punishment of the grave. Fine, don't take Hakkunnas. Return it back, go home, prepare your list. How many people have you taken money from years ago and do not want to return? Return it back. That person who is coming doesn't send an email, I am coming to take you. He comes all of a sudden. You don't have time, I don't have time. Prepare that list. Let's not remain into a world of fallacy. That when he comes we find it's too late, we cannot return. Haq nas. Not to be forgiven till that haq is returned. So you got two solutions, huh? As we reach, as we talk about problems, you're talking about solutions as well. So you've come to know the second solution to prevent ourselves from the punishment of the grave. Never take the property of the people. If you've taken it, then we need to return it fast. Third thing that comes out. As we are moving for the punishment, and as we are going forward, we find that having gone through this, I will just now shift from the sins and go directly to those solutions. Go directly to the solutions. One of the things, because we had said this tonight's entire lecture will be devoted either to find out what sins that are there that cause the punishment of the grave or what are the things that we can do to protect ourselves. One of the things that can help us is what is referred to as sadaqa. We may think it is to be very small. But remember that, that first night of the grave that I was talking to you about, and this intense uh, narrations and emphasis of the narration stating, beware of the first night of Qabr, because of the severity. At that time, if you remember, I had said, one of the things that has been recommended to provide ease and comfort to a person who is, in, as you, who, who is suffering the first night of Qabr or experiencing the first night of Qabr is Salatul Wahshat. Correct? According to traditions, in that first night of Qabr, the maximum benefits that can pro be provided to a person who has died and is in the grave for the first night are two things. I have to split the ahadith based on the movement of my topic. So that time I'd mentioned one. Tonight, the opportunity for the second thing. All of us have relatives who have passed away. All of us have near ones who have passed away. Someone's father, someone's mother, someone's grandfather, children, whoever. We need to provide them. We need to help them. And one of the things that has been repeatedly stressed by the Holy Prophet, that one thing that helps a deceased, whether it is in the first night of the grave, or his entire period of barzak is sadaqah. Two things help on the first night of the grave, salatul wahshat and sadaqah. It is said you recite one salatul wahshat. But sadaqah, it is said keep giving sadaqah on that night of, uh, first night of Kabra. 
The first hand of keep giving sadaqah. The more the sadaqah is given, that is the best thing, the most beneficial thing. We don't know why. I don't know why Surah Yasin has not come. I don't know why Surah Mulk has not been mentioned as providing the maximum benefits. But traditions do say, two things provide maximum benefit in the first night of Qabr, Salatul Wajshad and Sadaqah. But Sadaqah goes a step forward, because the Prophet says, and he's telling his companions, remember your deceased after going from this world, need you more than they have ever needed you while in this world. Your deceased needs you more in the hereafter, more than needed, they needed you in this world. Our parents need us uh, in this world. Let not a person's position, age, rank, richness, let this be forgotten. Uh. The night of Ashur, don't miss that lecture. Get your children along with you. We're going to discuss something that is very important. They need us more in the hereafter than what they need us in this world. And the Prophet says, one of the best things that you can give to them is sadaqah. Give giving sadaqah. Because the sadaqah not only helps them in the grave, it also prepares for our comfort when we go into the grave. But in giving the sadaqah, there is one thing that is important. At times, we as a people are very possessive of our, of our things. And we as a people are very hesitant to pass our, our benefits to the others if we do not benefit. Sadaqah giving helps the disease. But sadaqah giving also helps us. But when it comes to sadaqah, one thing that we notice that, Apre Vilma loves you. We've got so many millions of dollars. Uh, so many thousands of dollars. Uh, so many hundreds of dollars. After we die, this money should go over here, this money should go over here. We don't want to give it back, we are living, huh? when we need it. We write it, Maria Pati, we are not going to take these green bills over there, right? Nobody knows that green bills over there. So we are not going to take it. So after we die, rather than my wife, use it higher. Send it out so that I get some money. Fine, not a problem, good thing. Not a very good thing. No, I want to say not a very good thing. Something better than this is there. Is, uh, th then this is there. And the tradition says, Sadaka given after a person has died is one thing. Sadaka given while a person is alive is another thing. Lot of difference, huh? Somebody gives Sadaka and writes in his will, after I die, so much given to this organization. Good. Tawak. The benefits reduce. If this person were to give a m minimal amount of that, while he was alive. Listen to this hadith. And then understand. There are so many things that we need to understand. But unfortunately we lose track. And then we complain there are no ways to help us out. No, the ways are there. Listen to this tradition. A person dies at the time of the Holy Prophet, Medina. Person dies. They open his will. After burial everything is done, they open his will. Saying, I've got a warehouse full of debts. I want it to be given a sadaqah. The relatives come to the Prophet, our father, mother, whoever has died, has, has written this. Saying, Alhamdulillah. Jazahullah al khair. May Allah give him jazah. Give it a sadaqah. So they open the warehouse, huge quantities of debts, picked up and given a sadaqah. When everything is gone, when everything is gone, they come to the Prophet, now what do we do? He's saying, now the warehouse is yours. We will do it, distribute it according to the laws of inheritance. Not a problem. So everybody goes away. Holy Prophet himself was supervising the distribution. Everything finished, they go away. The cleaning starts. As the cleaning starts, when the cleaners are cleaning the warehouse, in the far corner of the warehouse, they found one small piece of rotten, almost rotten, not rotten, almost, very ripe. Another day and it would start rotting. Small little piece. Now those cleaners come up and take it to the to the to the to the uh, to the warith, to the heirs of this person deceased and say, we found this small piece of of date. What do we do? He's saying we don't know. Let's go to the prophet. So they go to the prophet. Saying now what? He's saying we were cleaning my father's warehouse and we found this small piece of date in the far corner. What do we do with it? So prophet says according to his will, you give it a sadaqah. But then he says a sentence. He's saying. 
Alas! Had this man given this one piece of date while he was alive as sadaka, he would have got more rewards than having given the entire warehouse of sadaka after he is dead. He is saying, had this man given this small piece of date while he was alive as sadaka, he would have got more rewards than this entire warehouse that he has given after his death. Because now that he is dead, he doesn't need that dates. So for him to give, yes, it's a good thing. But it doesn't show the sincerity towards Allah. It is when a person is alive and there is a possibility of him needing that thing. But he says, no, I will not take it and I will use it for those whom Allah is happy with and those who are impoverished. That is where the concern, that is where the sentiments come forward. And with the sentiments come the reward. See? So it is said, start giving sadaqah. Now we need to move fast. We are, we are rushing, we are falling short of time. Sadaqah. Second very important thing. Second very important thing which protects a person. Now you have to take everything into account. Huh? All those things that we said from last night. Another thing that helps in the punishment or for the punishment in the grave is the ziyarat of Hussain ibn Ali. One sure shot method. Somebody wants to be protected from the punishment of the grave, the ziyarat of Hussain ibn Ali. You remember what? I will link it when I come a little later. If we want to be certain to recite the, to, that we want to save ourselves from the punishment, then it's Hussain and Ziyarat. But over here, let us get one thing very clear. Islam is not a religion for the agniya and the rich. Islam is not a religion only for the wealthy. Islam is not a religion by means of which a person who doesn't have money, he strikes his hand on the head and says, Had I money, I too would have been able to get that reward. No. So when we say ziyarat of Hussein ibn Ali, the first thing that comes to mind is pack up your bags and go to Karbala. That is the thing that comes to mind. Fine, fair enough. But Islam never says that when I... And it is there in the traditions. It doesn't mean that when you say that you do the ziyarat of Hussein, it means packing your bags and going to Karbala. Those who can afford can do that. What happens to those who cannot afford? What happens to those who cannot go? What happens who cannot go because of finance? What happens who cannot go because of health? What happens who cannot go because of political reasons? What happens? Do they become mahroom? Muslim Ibn Aqil told us, no, they don't become mahroom. Because you remember on that time when Muslim Ibn Aqil was supposed to be beheaded, and he sought a time, and then he realized that he did not have the means to meet the Imam. What did he do? He turns toward the direction in which Hussein is coming and he says, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. And there you remember we said Hussein was sitting. All of a sudden he turns, he stands up and turns to Kufa and says, Wa alaikum salam ya Muslim ibn Aqil. It means that whenever a person is able to make the trip to Karbala, he makes the trip to Karbala. If he is not able to make the trip to Karbala, he doesn't need to make the trip to Karbala. And that is the reason you will find in Mafatih al-Jinan, on the night of the 23rd of Ramadan, it is recommended that on the night of the 23rd, as on the night of the 21st, as on the night of 19th, one of the best acts is the ziyarat of Hussein. And there Sheikh Abbas al-Qumi writes, those who cannot go to Karbala, all that they need to go is to go on top of the roof of their house, turns to a turn towards Karbala and says, Salaamu Alaikum Ya Hussain Ibn Ali. That itself will qualify a person. That itself will qualify a person that he's done the ziyarah. And you can be sure about it. And I am sure about it. That just as Hussain replied to Muslim Ibn Aqil, he will reply to your salam and my salam. He is Imam. He is not bound by time, limit, space, venue, and position. So, ziyarat of Hussein very important. However, wherever, in whatsoever manner, salam upon Hussein. Listen to this incident. And I will make it a point to mention events so that you realize and it is understood. All these are not stories coming from out of our pockets. An incident that took place. This is 
a very ma'roof incident whereby a person sees it's Haji Muhammad Ali Yazdi narrated by him. He's saying I had a friend whom we grew up together with. And we were growing up together. When we grew up together, he became a tax collector in the government machinery. A tax collector is regarded as the most reprehensible person in a government ministry or government organization. Because his job is to collect taxes. If a person doesn't pay tax, he has to force. If he doesn't pay, then he hits. If he doesn't pay, he kills. If he doesn't pay, he loots. He has to take the money from that person to return to the public treasury. A very hated person. And because of the nature of the job, a person who becomes a tax collector ends up hurting people. Physically and, and mentally. And so he takes a lot of... Basically, he is a person who commits dhulm, oppression. Because the power given to him by the, by the ruling machinery and the nature of the job, he has to extract money. If you don't give, then he extorts money. But he has to get the money to pay to his superiors. He's saying, Ma, uh, uh, Haji Muhammad Ali, yes, he says, there was this friend of mine, we grew up together. But then when we grew up together, he became a tax collector. Now this tradition is narrated in two, three different versions. I'm picking up one of them and narrating it to you. And I was, became a religious person and, and was leading a, a simple life, trying to be the obedient servant of God, following the rulings of God, till all of a sudden one day my friend dies. I knew that his, his, his behavior in this world was how. So I was expecting him to be in what state. Unfortunately, after a month, I see him in my dreams. But I see him in a very different state. I see him in ease. I see him in comfort. I see him relaxed. I see him being served. I see him having a position, rank. And I tell him, Ya Fulan, I have known you for, for the entire life. We were friends, remember? We were friends, remember? And I know you were the, the, the things that you would do and the oppression that you would perpetrate and the, and the torture that you would commit on the people from whom you were collecting taxes. You don't deserve this sort of a position. You don't deserve this sort of a place that you are in. What happened? He's saying, you're right. This I realized when I died. As to my mistake in this world. And I was an intense problem. Intense pain. Intense punishment till last night. Saying, what happened last night? He's saying, all of a sudden, last night, Imam Hussein came into the graveyard three times. And the third time that he came, he ordered all the punishment from all the inmates of this Qabristan be lifted. The moment he said this, the malak of Adab took off and left. Since that time, now I'm in comfort. So this Mullah uh, uh, Muhammad Ali Yazdi is saying, Imam Hussein comes to your graveyard. Three times, for what? He's saying, I don't know. But I do know and we were informed that your punishment has been warded off because Imam Hussein's, upon Hussein's instruction, and because Hussein had come to do the ziyarat of a lady who was buried yesterday afternoon. That means a lady was buried yesterday afternoon. Because of that, Imam Hussein came to do her ziyarat three times. The third time that Imam Hussein came to do ziyarat, before he was leaving, he passed the instructions, all the angels of Adab go from here. This place has now become the place of Amn. Now this Muhammad Ali Yazdi is amazed. He's saying Hussein comes to the graveyard for that lady three times. Who is that lady? He's saying, I don't know. But in his dream he says, ten blocks from where I am buried is the grave of this lady. Find out who she is. Now Mullah Muhammad Ali yes, is, is amazed. He's saying, how could it be that for a lady Hussein comes three times and then in the last time when he's going, not only he goes but he takes away the adab of everybody. So he goes to the graveyard. This is the night in the morning when he gets up, he's disturbed. He says, I want to go to the bottom of this. I want to get to the bottom of this. He goes to the graveyard, asks the caretaker, was there a lady buried yesterday? He's saying, yes. He's saying, can you show me where she's buried? So he takes him. 
exactly that location where his friend told him at night, ten blocks from where his grave was. Who is this lady? Saying, I don't know. Do you know her relatives? Saying, yes. Who is the relative? The husband. Do you know the name? Saying, yes. Gives the name. Address? Yeah. He goes to that person. He saying, excuse me, uh, your, I heard your wife passed away yesterday. He saying, yes, my wife passed away yesterday. He saying, I'm so sorry, condolences, formalities done. He's saying, uh, did your wife, uh, was she a regular visitor to the shrine of, of Hussain in Karbala? He's saying, no, we don't have so much money that she would go to Karbala. In fact, she's not even gone once. Oh, uh, what she reciting Matsam and Nauha of, of Hussein the Masaib, saying, no, she was an ordinary housewife. Then she must be reciting Majlis of Hussein. He's saying, no, she was a wife, housewife, but now he's getting irritated. Why are you asking me so many questions about my wife? Yes, yeah, she's dead, but why are you asking me so many questions about my wife? He's saying, there's a reason for it. He's saying, what? Muhammad Ali Yazdi then informs him. This is what I witnessed in the dreams. And it seems that Hussein has come three times since the time your wife passed away to greet her and to meet her. And on the third time when he was going, he picked away the adab of everybody. And I want you to know what she has done to entitle and be entitled for this kind of honor from Hussein ibn Ali. And that's the reason I'm asking, did she go to Karbala regularly? Was she reciting the Masaib of Hussain regularly? Was she reciting the Majlis of Hussain? He's saying, no, that's nothing of this sort. But I do remember one thing that she was very, very particular about. It's been several decades that she would make it a point never to miss Ziyarat Ashura every day. She would make it a point not to miss Ziyarat Ashura every day. Even if she missed out on a day, she would do the kava of it as if it's a wajib thing. This lady for several years is sending salams to Hussein. And she's thinking Hussein is not replying. But Hussein says, you keep sending. I will give you a salam at a time when it matters to you the most. I will come to you when you are in your grave. And when I go away, not only will I take everything away from you, the punishment. Because of you, I will give everybody ease, whoever is in that graveyard. This is the reason we say that we don't need to get despondent. From the very beginning I'm saying, yes, these lectures are disturbing. They will be jolting. But it, that jolting is required to set us right, not for us to become despondent. When you have people like Hussein ibn Ali, three times Hussein comes back. The hujjat of God comes. Why? Because an ordinary lady has made it a point to send her salams to him every day. He's saying, I will not let it go to vain. You may think I'm not responding. I will respond in a manner that you will never even imagine the benefits it will reap out to you. And because of this we say, as long as we've got Ahlul Bayt, we've got nothing to fear. But, there are conditions applied. So the second thing that is beneficial for protecting a person from the punishment of the grave ziyarat. The ziyarat of Hussein, and it doesn't take long. Every day if we teach our children, you get up, or you're going to school, or you're coming before going to sleep, say, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Hussain ibn Ali. How long does it take? 40 days, 2 months, 3 months, that person will become his habit. He becomes his habit, not only he is doing it for himself, the rewards are coming to you, my friends. But do we take that effort? Do we have that much time? To sit with our children. All the life of the West has taken us up so much. That we don't have time for our children. Why is this important? It is important because the next most important thing that can save a person from the punishment of the grave is a good child. A pious child. A righteous child who has the love of Hussein and who's got the ability to bow his head before God for all his rulings. A pious child. A good upbringing of a children. Listen to the story, then I will give you a majlis on this. 
The sixth Imam is narrating. Sadiq Ali Muhammad Ja'far ibn Muhammad in the Sadiq. The sixth Imam is narrating. And this tradition has been narrated by on the kind of two entities and two personalities. One the Holy Prophet and one Nabi Isa. The Prophet was going once with his companions from a graveyard. As he was going from the graveyard, he passes by a certain grave. And as he's going by that grave, his companions suddenly see that the Prophet begins to run. They were not expecting it. Suddenly they see the Prophet running. So they to become and begin to run to catch up with him. They're surprised, but they don't ask anything then. They pass the graveyard, they come out. Saying, Ya Rasulullah, suddenly what happened? We were going well and all of a sudden we started to run. He's saying, I was running because that person who was in the grave was being subjected to an intense punishment of the grave. And the punishment was so severe, so intense, that I was frightened for myself and us, that lest it happens, that that punishment also encompass us. And this is the ruling of God at times, that when the punishment comes on an in totality over a community, then even good people in that community become part of that adab, except the prophets who are taken out. That's another issue. The Prophet is going, he goes out, he explains that grave is having a problem. I was worried for myself, for all of us, that less God's adab and ghadab takes over us. So I ran so that I could go as far as possible from the vicinity of that grave. Fine. Explanation accepted. They go off. Two days later, three days later, they're coming back again. And again, the route was from that same graveyard. Now they remembered that particular grave, the Prophet had run, so now they're all waiting. They're all waiting, they could see him running, so now they know that when he's going to come over there, again he's going to run. The same when they're there, they're ready, getting ready to run, all of a sudden problem. No, not a problem, amazing thing. Now the Prophet, the way he was going, he still slows down. He becomes more slow. So slow as if he doesn't want to move from that place. Worried, what is happening? We were expecting to run. Now he's not running, he slowed down. Eventually they pass out of the graveyard and say, Hiya, hold on Baba. What is the situation? Initially when we went, you went fast. Coming back, we thought you would go fast, you're going slow. What happened now that, you made, that made you go slow? He's saying, on this grave there was so much rahmat of God that was being rescinded that I wanted to delay my departure from the vicinity of the grave with the hope that probably some of that rahmat would encompass me and us. Khuba explanation accepted. Problem is, it was the same grave two days that he rushes and gets away because of intense punishment. The same grave, two, three days later, coming back, converted into Kabisa, Rahmat of God. The problem with these companions was that, what did this dead person do in these two, three days to get converted, to convert that intense punishment into intense Rahmat? Person is dead, he cannot do anything, but still something has happened as a result of it, the things have changed. He's saying, Ya Rasulullah, what has happened? What did he do? The Prophet says, he did not do anything. Somebody else did for him. He's saying, who did for him? When he had died, he had left a small child behind. That small child began to grow. At a certain time, when he grew up, the mother said, now he's become bold, he's become big enough for him to go to the madrasa. So this mother sends the child to the madrasa. In the madrasa, the malim who is teaching him says, Today is your first day and first lecture. And for everything, when you begin, you must take the name of God. So my son recite, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When the malim recited, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the child repeated, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As soon as he repeated, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, God told the angels of punishment, Come back! 
It does not befit me that my servant's child is calling me by my name of mercy and rahmat and I punish the father of this child by means of punishment. Convert this punishment into rahmat and beneficent because of this child who has recited Bismillah rahman You realize the importance of these children. You realize how important the part these children play, not only for themselves but for us. It is not for any reason that everybody who comes over here to recite has emphasized, take care of your children. If not for themselves, be selfish and take care of our, because of our own selves. Let us be selfish. We don't care about them, fine, don't care about them for themselves. But you do care and I do care about myself. At least for myself make them righteous and religious. At least for myself and our own self should I not look at if I'm giving them dunyavi and secular education and I'm depriving them of religious education, not giving importance to religious education at my own peril. Then when I go down and there is nobody to recite Bismillah rahman rahim when there is nobody to send me Fatiha on Shabe Jumu'ah, there is nobody to send me Thawab of Dua'i Kumail, then it's only me to be blamed on. Because all that I've given to my son is a master's degree and a doctorate degree. I've never taught him what Fatiha means. I've never taught him what it means to sit on Shabe Jumu'ah reciting Dua'i Kumail. He will wreck his life, but I am also wrecking my life. At least, worst of all, let me be selfish and for my sake make him religious, Baba. What is it? Why do we not want to teach our children by example? Why is it that I'm hearing that there's such a dichotomy and hypocrisy in the house? That it is only when somebody wants to come into the mosque, the hijab comes on the head. But when a lady goes out, that hijab goes off. What message am I passing to my daughter? That I have a dual personality in life, one to show my community members, and one what you want to lead your life in this world. There is no personal life in this world. Huh? Only life that we've got is given by God. This hypocrisy that we have in the house. When we are going to the mosque, we say, Aje ban karina ko, aje jeshi nao moharam che, aat moharam che, Hazrat Abbas ni tari che, music ban karo bana. Ko Hazrat Abbas music is only to be stopped on the shan, the 8th of Muharram. On the other days we can listen to the music. What example am I setting? Shabe Ashu, Shabe Juma, I am supposed to be in the mosque. What am I doing outside in the club? What message am I passing my son? You and me are sitting over here because our parents pulled us into the Imam Barga. So that now when they are no more, we are still coming over here. Why do we not make that effort? Why don't we spend time with our children explaining to them what religion is? How many times do we sit in a week and talk to them some mas'ala of fiqh from Tawdihul Masail? We spend so much money to educate them academically. How much do we spend time to educate them religiously? Because this religious education is going to come to us. And you will see the detriment in another four or five lectures that we discuss of not getting our children the religious knowledge. Because these very children, when the hukm of God will come to them, na'udhu billah, and God forbid this ever happens. But if it happens that this child is made to go to hell, this child will not go alone. My son will drag me along that, Ya Allah, the sheikh gave me a master's degree in whatever field, but he never took time to explain to me that it is wajib to keep a beard. God will say, is that the case? Son, you go. Father sheikh, follow him inside. At least let us be selfish. Then we say our children do not come. Who if there's hypocrisy in the house, they will never learn. Because they will learn to understand, to develop a dual personality in life. When they're in the house, they will say, MashaAllah and SubhanAllah. Moment they go into those football fields and it's those four letter words and seven letter words that will come out. We cannot afford to let them develop a dual personality. We have to mean still from this young age. I'm not talking even about 17 or 18. They are too old now for me. These age groups of 8 and 9 and 10, we have to start working. And then take them up slowly. 
what we make a mistake in our behavior with our children is that we want to instill into them a fear of an external policeman. Oh, my father is there, I must pray salat. Oh, my mother is there, I must pray salat. Oh, because my father will shout, I have to come to the mosque. This is not a correct way of bringing up a children. The correct way of bringing up a children is not an external policeman. Because still for so long as an external policeman is there with this child, this child will be good. The moment this external policeman is not there, this child will revert to his dual personality. And this is the reason we find all our children till they are within the safe and scones of the parents are good. The moment they get a chance to go to the universities, they wake break free. Because of the dual personality that has been developed into them from the house, starting from the parents and the relatives, that external policeman philosophy is an incorrect philosophy. That external philosophy, a father is not going to remain forever with the child. The father is going to die, he's going to become old. If he is understanding a philosophy of an external policeman, the moment that external policeman is not there, Violation will start. Come and look in Dar es Salaam. You've been to Dar es Salaam and Zanzibar. After 11 o'clock, whoever listens to the traffic lights? Whoever follows? Do they follow traffic lights? Tell me, Minhal. They don't follow the traffic lights. Because there is no policeman to come and say, Haya, Alf Tanu. <laughs> There's no policeman there at that time. So they break free. In the morning, nobody breaks. Why breaks? Because they've become accustomed to the external policeman. We need to instill into our children the policy and the ideology of an internal policeman. The fear of God and the love of God. That they need to know that it is for God they're doing, not for Sheikh or for the father. Why is it that when we see that, it's so amazing for me at times. When we walk past, suddenly the lady started adjusting the hijab. Oh, Baba! This hijab is not for me. It is not that you do hijab only from the sheikhs. It's from every namaharam. Why is it that it is only in front of us the hijab are adjusted? But when they go out, it's all free for all. The ruling of God, Baba, fear God, don't fear us. Why fear us? This is what we need to instill into our children. The internal policeman, that is the fear of God. The love of God simultaneously amalgamated. Once this is inculcated, no parent worry about his child. He may go into the worst of the scenario. But if he has developed that comprehension, that proper fear and the proper love of God, nothing will shift. You don't need a father to be getting him to pray namaz soup. You don't need a sheikh to be telling him to fast in the month of Ramadan. That love and fear of God will cause him to do whatever he wants. Just as you and me do without our parents telling us. This child we do before without you and me telling him. That is why we say, emphasizing so much on take care of your children, take time out for them, spend time for religious activities with them. Don't just suffice yourself into the academic world. Good, not, I'm not saying it's not good, but bad if at the compromise of religious education. Bad if at the compromise of religious knowledge. Message passed. Let's move forward. Few more things before we come to the Masaib. We want to know what can save us from the Adab, right? Solution. Aya, listen. One of the things that can save us. Now I'm going to give you three more things. Very short. One. Related to certain two months of the year. And one issue related to every week or a day in the week. Specifically singled out for the punishment of the grave. One thing that has been specifically mentioned. If a person wants to be protected, no. Mufati will say, whoever does this act will be saved from the punishment of the grave. Or the punishment of the grave will be alleviated. The punishment of the barzak will be alleviated. Remember when we talk about the grave, that is the period of barzak. So basically it encompasses everything. What is that month of Rajab? Which day? The first Shabi Jumu'ah. What Amal? 
the Amal al-Laylatul Raghaib. On the first shab e the Thursday Eve of the month of Rajab, it is referred to as the Laylatul Raghaib. Raghaib is the plural form of Raghba. Raghba means desiring to come closer or desiring, wanting. Raghba means want. <coughs> Raghaib means more wanting, many wantings. Laylatul Raghaib means is the night in which you ask and want from God and He will give you. What is this night? The first Thursday Eve of the month of Rajab. The amal of this Laylatul Raghaib is what has been explained in the traditions can help a person from the punishment of the grave. But the important thing is that this amal which consists of a 12 rakat prayer between Maghrib and Aisha and this first Thursday night of the month of Rajab, it starts off with 12 rakat namaz in each rakat alhamd and then you have to recite surahs and 2-3 instances, I don't go into the details. But the point is that this amal is preceded by a fasting of the day of Thursday. So you fast the day of Thursday, then you go into the night. Once you go into the night, you break your fast, recite Maghrib, and before you recite Isha, you have to do this amal, a 12 rakat prayer. Tradition says, whoever does this gets a lot of protection in the grave from the punishment of the grave. One, immediately month after that, after that, the month of Shaban. It says another thing that can help a person from the punishment of the grave is fasting in the month of Shaban. But a specific number has been stated. In the month of Shaban, if somebody fasts for 12 days, if a person completes 12 fasts in the month of Shaban, this immensely helps in the punishment of the grave. And finally, the third one which is related to the week and not to the months. So you have first one, the month of Rajab, the Amal of Laylatul Raghad. And the second, the month of Shaban, fasting 12, night, 12 days in the month of Shaban. 12 days, huh? I don't know the reason. It's been said. 12 days you have to fast. A person who fasts 12 days in the month of Shaban can expect a lot of protection in the punish, from the punishment of the grave. And the third thing, this you have to wait for a year. This is so simple, huh? Every week, you and me, both of us can do it. We do a certain aspect of it. But because of not understanding, we do not do the whole thing. One of the things that has been stated to have a very beneficial effect in the punishments of the grave is the ghusl of the day of Friday. Everybody takes a shower every day. So also on a Friday. There is no difference between a ghusl and a shower except the niyat. We usually go for, for, for a shower. It just needs to make a niyat. Every week one niyat rectifies, registers as a, as a ghusl. Automatically it helps out into the grave and the punishment. We want to know what is protecting us, right? So when we have these things with us. Now I am just telling you one simple fact. We keep getting questions, why, how can you do this, how can you do this, what will happen, how can we save ourselves? But having known these things, despite having knowledge about these things, despite having information about these things, if we don't act, and then we go down, and then we are faced with it, who is to be blamed? Knowing and we don't do it. Friday we will go, we will take a shower, we will not make the niyat of Ghusl, we come out. Whose fault? My fault then I shouldn't be complaining when I go down. <coughs> Sorry. But, having understood this, there is that concept <coughs> of sacrifice that counts. And the concept of sacrifice, specifically with respect to children. <coughs> I was asked a question. How much should we be teaching our 10-year-old children about God and the fright? Good question. And I had reserved the answer for tonight. Because I had wanted to prove this point by means of certain thing. It is this 10 year old child that needs to be molded. And the way to mold him is to give him correct information. And proper information. 
Because it is at this age of 9 and 10 that he is being molded. Saying this to a 70, 80 year old man is okay, good. But it doesn't have that much of an impact with respect to the molding. Because the stick has already become firm. The shaft and the stem has already become hard. It is this young form that the moment you turn, the stem will move in that direction. It is at this age that we need to inculcate in them the love of God and the fear of God. Because once you do that, then you are doing the sunnah of you know who? Awni Muhammad. Nine and ten year old children. But listen to how they interpret God and look at their jazba and their emotions and their feelings towards God. Then we know how much we need to work on our nine year olds and ten year olds. On oh, Muhammad nine ten. Not more than that. But look at how they go about it. This is what the Ahlul Bayt teach us. That you work with your children right from they are small. Right from the time they are small, our young, young girls, from the very small, small age, why is it not that they are taught that that intermingling with the males has to be curtailed from the very beginning? Why not? Just because we stay in the West, we compromise our culture, our religion, our rulings of God. Ahlul Bayt teach us now from the very beginning, whatever the age, start working. Start working, start working. Till you get a child... Nine and ten, ready to die. When Hussein left from Medina, and then to Kufa, and then to Karbal, uh, to Makkah, he did not take Awn Muhammad with him. This Awn Muhammad for whom we are, we are listening over here tonight, they were initially not part of the program, and the entourage. They were left behind by Hussein. Why? Because Hussein had taken Zainab along with him. What does that got to do with Awnu Muhammad? The fact is that Hussein sets off, he takes Zainab with her, with him, he leaves behind Awnu Muhammad. With whom? With the husband of Zainab, Abdullah. Abdullah who? The son of Jafar Tayyar. Very old. Very old. Can hardly walk. Almost blind. Hussein says, Oh, no, Muhammad, you cannot come. You have to stay with your father. Your mother is coming with me. You stay behind. Agreed. They leave behind. The caravan comes out. After having come out of Mecca, short time later, they hear somebody is coming behind. So the caravan holds. Who is it? Abdullah ibn Jafar al-Tayyar, old man. He's not alone with him, he's got Mu'awn and Muhammad with him. Surprise everybody, we had left Abdullah back. Oh, no, Muhammad is not with us, was not, were not supposed to come. Suddenly this old man, and he was regarded very highly, he was venerated. He was looked upon with great deference, Abdullah ibn Jafar al-Tayyar, husband of Bibi Zainab. <laughs> old man coming, supported by his two sons. They pitch tents, they hold fort, and they wait for him. He comes to Hussein and says, Hussein, I have got something to tell you. I, and these are the words. Huh? He says, I want to hold you back from going by catching your hair. This is so passionate I feel about you not going. Because I know where you are going, you are going to face deception and deceit. And had I my control, I would have held you by the hair and I would have pulled you back. Now, see a thing. But I also know that you are the Imam Barhaq. You are the true Imam. And if you have set out, you have been told by God to do so. I will not intervene. But I just need one work with my wife, Zainab, if I have your permission. Hussain says, Abdullah, she's your wife. You don't need to take my permission. Go. So word is sent to Zainab, Abdullah wants to talk to you. As soon as Zainab comes to know Abdullah has come, she feels Abdullah has come to take her back. So when he comes out and they, they, he does salams to her, she says, Abdullah, you've come. Are you coming to take me? But before you come to take me, let me tell you that as a husband, I have to obey you. But remember, if, if, if Zainab has to leave Hussein, Zainab will not go. It is only Zainab's body that will go with you. Zainab cannot be separated from Hussein. Abdullah says, but I've never said anything. 
I have just come to fulfill an obligation that I thought you had forgotten. So Zainab is saying what? He's saying you remember our grandfather had told us that whenever you are having a problem and you embark on a very difficult journey, you have to take a sadaqah with you. He's saying yes. He's saying I've got two sadaqah. One is on that you do sadaqah for Hussein on my behalf and Muhammad who do sadaqah for Hussein on your behalf. I have not come to take you Zainab. Go with Hussein. But don't go alone. Take my own and take my Muhammad. What else do we want to know how to bring up our children? Individuals sacrificing their 10 year old child for the sake of Hussein ibn Ali. And here for the sake of Hussein means for the sake of Islam, for the sake of Allah. The entire caravan begins to go. This caravan reaches, reaches Karbala, the second of Muharram, the third of Muharram, the fourth of Muharram. Shab-i Ashur comes. On the Shab-i Ashur, every tent is preparing their children. Because they know tomorrow everybody is going to die. Every tent there is some sort of conversation between the mother and the child going. And so also in Zainab stand now. She is preparing the children, my sons, fight properly tomorrow. Don't let me down tomorrow. Your job is to protect Akbar. Your job is to protect Asgar. Your job is to protect Qasim. You must die before everybody. You must die before everybody. The next morning comes and the battle begins. As soon as the battle begins, Amr Muhammad rushed to Hussein. Uncle, uncle, we want to fight. Hussein looks at them, nine year old, ten year old. On oh, Muhammad, what are you stating? He says, uncle, we want to do, we want to fight. Hussein says, no, I cannot send you. One after the other, everybody goes. Zuhair goes. Muslim Ibn Ausaja goes. Habib goes. Everybody is going. And every time a body is coming, Zainab would look at on Muhammad and say, hey, you're still alive. You've still not died. You've still not killed yourself for the Hussain, for my brother. He's saying, but whenever we go to uncle, he's not giving us permission. This kept going and kept going. <laughs> Till a time comes when Akbar also goes away and is, is martyred. When Akbar comes now and on Muhammad comes, as soon as Zainab looks at them, she turns her face away. On Muhammad worried, mother, are you angry with us? He's saying, you're asking me whether I'm angry. The son of Hussein has died. And you, my sons, are still alive. How do you expect me to show my face to Zahra on the day of judgment? That Akbar died, but my son was still alive. They fold their hands and says, Mother, but we cannot do anything. Because whenever we go to Uncle Hussein, he just turns us back. If you get us permission, then you see how we fight for Islam and for Hussein. She goes to the tent of Hussein and says, Hussein, I've got a, I've got a request. I need a favor from you. Hussein says, Zainab, I would love to hear your request. Let me know what it is. He's saying, Brother Hussein, let on and Muhammad go for the battle. Let on and Muhammad go for the battle. This is my personal request. The Hussein could not turn a personal request of Zainab. He says, Haya, Mohan and Muhammad go. But they are so small. These On and Muhammad are so small. They cannot sit on the horse by themselves. Horses are brought. Hussein puts On on top. Hussein put Muhammad on top. And they both go. Small little children, but they are Bani Hashima. They're fighting and fighting till a time comes when they're surrounded by enemies. These eight, nine, ten year old boys, how much could they fight? A time comes when they fall down from the horse. As soon as they fall down, Hussein calls you Abbas. Hey Abbas, ya khi, you go pick up one lasha. I will go and pick up the other lasha. Both of them run. One of them picks up one child. The other one picks up the other child. Both the child are being brought into the tent. As they are brought into the the ladies start doing matam because the younger one has died. 
Now the one remaining, as that person, that young one, the elder one is looking at the mother. Hussain says, Zainab, bow down and take him into your arms. He's going. Hussain bends down, Zainab bends down. But before she could cuddle the child, the child looks at the mother and says, just one thing. He folds his hands and says, Amma, oh my mother, I hope now you are happy with us. We have given up our lives. Having said this, the soul of own past. Away. The soul of Muhammad passed away. Zainab and the ladies begin the matam. Wa awna. Wa Muhammad. Wa siya alamu al-ladhina. Zalamu. Ayyamun qalbi. Yen qalibun. Ala wa la'anatullahi. Ala al-qawm al-zalamin. Matam al-hasun. Mamu pesad ke huwe. تیغو سے زخمی ہوئے خون میں ترابتے ہوئے دل کا نمت